Hi, I'm Dr. James Amos. I'm a consulting psychiatrist at University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics in Iowa City. And uh, this is uh, another in the series of Dirty Dozens on um, Psychosomatic Medicine. And this one is about uh, psychosocial assessments uh, for transplant psychiatry. And uh, if you're seeing this on YouTube, uh, you're welcome to go to my website, The Practical Psychosomaticist. Uh, at jajsamos.wordpress.com uh, to see the full presentation with slides and annotations. Um, I'm going to uh, follow uh, some uh, slides here that I have in front of me so that I stay on track and uh, will have time only for a brief overview of this process and I'll confine myself to uh, adult uh, transplant psychiatry. Uh, first off is a historical overview and that's slide three. Uh, in, uh, it sort of covers a broad spectrum uh, of time from 1933 uh, in which the first human kidney transplant was performed all the way up to 1978 uh, when cyclosporin, an immun immunosuppressive agent, was first introduced and it marked passing from an experimental procedure to the standard of care in uh, transplant surgery. And in the, in the 1980s, the United Network of Organ Sharing or UNOS started uh, administering the Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network, or OPTN. And it facilitates organ match matching uh, and data collection about transplants in the U.S. Uh, and they included a uh, uh, link to uh, the OPTN website. Slide four uh, has to do with um, talking about organ transplant as an emotional experience and it's an emotional experience not just for the patient but for transplant center teams which uh, consists of a wide variety of stakeholders including uh, surgeons, um, other med surge specialists, uh, the transplant coordinator and many others. We often think of uh, organs as uh, and the organ transplant as being the gift of life but implied questions often come up that might strike the the patient as uh, being sort of uh, confrontive uh, or provocative, such as, hey, why do you need a new organ? Do you deserve it? Uh, how bad do you want it? And what will you do in order to preserve the graft? Those are questions that are legitimate, and depending on how they are delivered, will uh, make the patient a, uh, uh, a central figure that feels, who feels supported uh, uh, throughout this uh, this very challenging process. Slide five is about candidate selection, uh, which is made necessary by the scarcity of cadaver organs. Uh, and the number of persons needing transplant far exceeds the number of available organs. And each year, unfortunately, 10 to 15 percent of liver, heart, and lung transplant candidates will die while on the wait list. And a shocking figure is that about 18 people a day die uh, waiting for uh, organs uh, on the wait list. Graft survival rates also happen to be lower than patient survival rates, so many will need more than one transplant. So the implications for transplant centers and patients is that there's a need to craft selection criteria to find optimal candidates, and this drives the trend uh, to try to find living-related donors and altruistic donors. <clears throat> Psychosocial evaluations are now considered to be an essential part of the selection process and greater than 95% of transplant programs now require some kind of psychosocial evaluation, whether they are done by psychiatrists uh, or transplant social workers or other mental health care providers. Slide six is um, about uh, an important issue uh, involving how we view the psychiatrist in uh, the transplant, pro the transplant evaluation process uh, and whether we view the psychiatrist as a gatekeeper or a collaborator. And uh, thankfully we're moving beyond uh, the uh, stage where we view the psychiatrist as a gatekeeper and we've evolved much beyond that. Uh, challenges with viewing the psychiatrist or uh, psychosocial evaluator as a gatekeeper are that it tends to perpetuate a paternalistic care model. It also focuses the role of rationing, or tends to focus the role of rationing on one member of the transplant team. Uh, and uh, there's a difficult balancing act between identifying mental illness and uh, helping the transplant team resist the tendency 
uh, uh, to stereotype uh, that mental illness. Uh, there's also difficulty in being identified as one who can detect impression management by the potential transplant candidate, which may involve uh, normal putting one's best foot forward in the pre-transplant evaluation process to actively hiding um, stigmatized problems such as mental illness and substance abuse, which uh, there are resources for treatment. Uh, viewing the psychiatrist as a gate, uh, as a collaborator rather, uh, and as an inter interdisciplinary team member has many advantages. Uh, there are many members on the team, as I've already alluded to, and as uh, we work together as a team, we can focus on identifying psychosocial challenges uh, to address in order to maximize post-transplant chances of a successful outcome for uh, the uh, potential transplant candidate. Slide 7 is uh, a, a little bit more on uh, the psychiatrist as collaborator. Uh, the psychiatrist as collaborator has a duty to several stakeholders, and that's to the transplant candidate, other patients on the wait list, living related donors if they are viable alternatives to cadaver organ uh, transplantation, uh, to society in terms of uh, husbanding the scarce, or, uh, scarce resource of cadaver organs and also to the transplant service, which in order to sustain an acceptable uh, accreditation status must also sustain an acceptable survival rate of patients. Uh, it's also important to point out that uh, uh, with regard to the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, psychosocial assessments regarding this prohibit discrimination on the basis of eligibility criteria that may disproportionately affect Americans with disabilities. Uh, denials of organs should be based on scientifically valid criteria to the extent that they're available. And transplant programs should make reasonable steps to compensate for any disability. Slide 8 has to uh, do with preoperative uh, psychosocial evaluations. The goals are to assess the psychosocial function of the candidate and uh, his or her support group. Uh, it's also to assess mental status and decisional capacity. Um, uh, the third uh, goal is to ascertain the, the candidate's suitability, and that entails uh, trying to evaluate several characteristics of the patient and uh, the patient's support group. Uh, it's also uh, important to diagnose psychiatric disorders that may interfere with su suitability, and also to identify resources for enhancing suitability. Common contraindications uh, from a psychiatric standpoint to uh, a uh, suitability uh, to uh, suitable uh, candidates would be active psychosis, uh, active substance abuse, uh, a history of non-compliance with medical recommendations, and uh, some uh, transplant programs uh, involving certain organs tend to be stricter, such as for heart transplant, and others tend to be a little more lenient, uh, such as kidney transplant, because of the availability of uh, alternatives, such as dialysis. Slide 9 is about uh, the uh, data supporting psychosocial evaluations and their usefulness, and uh, I'll touch on um, a couple of rating scales or decision support tools that we use. Uh, some preoperative psychiatric syndromes persist and worsen postoperatively, and we need to be aware of that so that we can provide greater support to the patient. Uh, delirium is a very common problem in up to 70% of patients who uh, have uh, chronic organ failure and they're at higher risk for delirium postoperatively and we need to be uh, on the alert for that. Uh, mood and anxiety disorders uh, that uh, can be exacerbated by common immunosuppressive agents like corticosteroids uh, are a pro an issue that we need to be aware of and uh, be ready to address uh, when and if they occur. Personality uh, disorder um, as it uh, um, arises tends to uh, cause or lead to worse outcomes uh, in terms of survival uh, and morbidity, mainly because of noncompliance uh, with uh, medical recommendations. Psychiatric disorders, though, per se, uh, in terms of their impact on survival and morbidity, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really not clear that uh, psychiatric disorders by themselves lead to uh, worse outcomes um, uh, per se. And this comes from uh, the uh, 
uh, reference uh, from Rosenberger and others. Uh, one example of uh, a decision support tool uh, is the psychosocial assessment of candidates for transplantation, which has been around since the late 1980s. Uh, it's, uh, it focuses on specific psychosocial issues relevant to transplant rather than uh, psychiatric diagnoses per se. And uh, it was developed by um, Walpersh and Levinson at uh, Virginia Commonwealth U University, and it's uh, copyrighted, so you should obtain permission from uh, the developers before you use it. Uh, another newer uh, decision support tool is called the Stanford Integrated Psychosocial Assessment for Transplantation, or the CIPAT, and uh, this was developed by Dr. Jose Maldonado and uh, colleagues at Stanford. And uh, it has developed psychosocial listing criteria that uh, um, perform at least comparably to the PACT, according to the authors. Uh, uh, it has excellent integrator reliability. It's standardized and it identifies patients who might be at risk for negative outcomes post-transplant. Uh, it's a definite uh, uh, step forward in uh, the evaluation of uh, uh, potential transplant candidates and you can go to uh, the Stanford uh, Psychosomatic Medicine website to view that and once again you should uh, request permission to uh, use the scale uh, from Dr. Jose Maldonado and colleagues. Uh, in terms of um, the issue of living unrelated kidney donors, uh, um, uh, specifically altruistic donors, uh, this is uh, an, um, <clears throat> an important issue and living unrelated don donors may be sought on the internet and there's really no way to monitor or regulate uh, this kind of activity. It's illegal to buy and sell organs, uh, but it's, uh, it's really uh, very difficult to uh, um, regulate how donors and recipients get together who are uh, not related and uh, to uh, make sure that uh, altruistic donors uh, have the safest possible um, pre-transplant uh, medical and psychosocial evaluation so as to maximize outcomes for both the donor and the recipient. Uh, lower risk or protective factors for donors uh, in situations like this would be no recent losses or stressors, realistic expectations about the donation experience, and uh, a perception of the recipient outcome that is realistic as well. Higher risk factors uh, that may not bode well for donors in situations like this would be unrealistic expectations, a motive for recognition or publicity, uh, a, a relationship with the recipient, and uh, specifically one which may be subordinate. Uh, and also multiple stressors. Um, the, uh, 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 there is a, a very nice uh, blog post uh, uh, on my website by Dr. Stephen Potts in the United Kingdom uh, uh, about uh, this issue and I'd encourage you to read that and that'll be uh, in the list of references and resources. Uh, and the last, that last slide of course is uh, the list of references and resources. Um, for psychosocial assessments for organ transplant. And uh, it's a very brief overview. And it's really an introduction, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any comments or questions, please uh, visit uh, my website, The Practical Psychosomaticist, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>